good morning and welcome everyone. We're, we're grateful and glad to see so many of you joining us for today's webinar, uh, User Training Schneider Electric EcoStructure Control Expert, uh, formerly called Unity Pro. Um, we, know, we definitely know you guys are busy, you have a lot of things to do, and we hope that the time you guys spend with us today will, will provide you some information that's really valuable, can help you in the projects and the, the, the choices that you're making at, surround EcoStructure Control Expert and Schneider's uh, PLC programming software. So. We're going to jump right into it. We're really glad to have uh, Zach Gentry from Enterprise with us today and Alex Cruz um, from Schneider. And so they'll be introducing themselves when they get to the, the portions of material that they, they intend to cover. So yeah, let's, uh, let's get going. So what are we going to cover today? So we're going to in give an introduction to Control Expert, kind of what it is, what it covers, some main features. Then we're going to jump right into a live demo. So Zach's going to take us through and actually show the product, kind of show what it can do, uh, different features and things around it. Um, we'll talk about networking because that's kind of a critical part to understand just the, the physical equipment that goes along with the software. Um, and then we're going to transfer some best practices, things as an integrator that, that you know, folks that are using the software all the time are, are running up against, how you guys can take some of those things and apply them yourselves. Um, and general tips and tricks. And then Schneider will be covering different things about the product that covers cybersecurity, uh, their roadmap for the product, and what's coming up, especially the remainder of this year, and what's new in the recently re released version um, 15.0. So with that, I'll kick it over to Zach Gentry. Zach? All right, thanks, Lou. Yeah, so my name is Zach Gentry. I'm with Enterprise Automation. I'm a controls engineer. So I've done a number of projects with Unity Pro, now called Control Expert. Um, so I'm here just to share my knowledge with you guys and hopefully skill you up a little bit. If you've used it before, hopefully it's a, it's a refresher. And if you haven't used it before, I can kind of at least give you an introduction to what the product can do and a lot of the main features. Um, but in case you didn't know, it is a programming and configuration software for Monocon PLCs. Uh, and you may have heard the term PAC or process automation controller, uh, kind of the same thing if you're familiar with PLCs. So. All right, so just kind of covering a little bit of the supported hardware. Um, the new models that you guys have probably seen around are the M580 and the M340, but Control Expert still supports the old ones, the, the Quantums, the Momentums, there's a few other ones as well that you guys may be familiar with. Um, there's also a new, a new uh, MC80 uh, that will be supported uh, in the newer versions. Uh, so you can also look out for that. Um, and just kind of another kind of quick overview. The, this software lives between the equipment and SCADA, right? That's where the kind of the PLC lives is. You're collecting information from the equipment uh, and sensors either through a network connection or even a hardwired connection. And that data eventually gets transferred up to, you know, potentially a SCADA system or an HMI, like operator interface terminal, OIT. Um, what this software does is it programs the PLC. That's, that's kind of its main function. Um, and that's kind of where it fits into the automation stack. So, you know, it supports the five IEC languages, the 611, 313, uh, function block diagram, ladder diagram, et cetera. Um, it can do PLC simulator on your PC. Uh, it can do integrated conversion from some of the legacy software. So Unity essentially is the same thing as Control Expert. So you can, you can definitely convert from a Unity to a Control Expert program very, very easily. But you can also go from some of the older ones like Concept or ProWorks. Um, and, you know, just to kind of emphasize, this is, this is not visualization software. It's not SCADA software. It's not VFD programming software, and it's not even PLC programming software for some of the machine PLCs that Schneider offers, which is like the M200 series. Um, it's mainly for those, for the, the ones that I mentioned before, the process automation controllers. All right, so with that, I'm gonna give you guys a quick demo and I'm gonna share my screen. So you guys should be able to see my screen here. I've got uh, EcoStructure Control Expert open. Um, and yeah, so I, I'm actually gonna run through, I'm gonna create a new project and just kind of give you guys some of the basics. 
So right away, I'm just gonna, you can do file new or, or hit this little um, new file icon up at the top. And I'm gonna kind of show you like a few of the different uh, pieces of hardware that you can select. Um, and as well as a, a number of other features that you would just normally configure as a part of any typical project. So uh, let's see, I'm gonna pick an M580 on this one and an ethernet backlink. So you can see here, you can, you can browse through all the different types of uh, PLCs that are available for this particular version of Control Expert. I'm actually using uh, 14.1 on here. So you can see Momentum Premium and Quantum are all available. So I'll just pick this up, uh, this one in here. All right, so when you make your project, you're, you're off and running. Um, over on the left here, oh, actually, yeah, first of all, cybersecurity. Um, it is going to prompt you to, to create a password for your project immediately, um, uh, especially on the new versions of Control Expert. So I'll just, I'll just type something in to get it going. All right. And then, uh, so yeah, uh, this is kind of the development interface. You'll notice it's kind of similar to any other application you've used. And, uh, you know, the one that you can really compare this to is Studio 5000, if you live in that Allen Bradley world. Um, you know, the, the layout is, is pretty, yeah, hopefully familiar. You've got kind of your normal application, you know, windows up here. Uh, the main thing here is the project browser, which is where you're going to configure, you know, 99% of, of your project and then your application window or, what, you know, whatever you're opening up. So I'm going to run through these real quick and give you guys an overview of what you can do in each one. Um, and we'll start with configuration. So. We saw that when I first created my project, I had to create a PLC uh, and select a power supply. But uh, I can open up this configuration of the PLC bus here, and it'll actually show me, you know, this is what your rack looks like. You know, it's what it, how many slots I've got, in my my CPU, my power supply that I've selected, um, and you know, I can go ahead and configure uh, a bunch of modules in my rack. So I can double click on it here, and it'll open up this hardware browser. And I can look at all the analog modules available for this CPU that I've selected here. Um, and then you, you know you can also go from the side menu over here, and you can you can drag and drop. So I can select an analog module, drop it on here, and select the uh, type of addressing for it, which we're not going to cover today. And you know I can open this up, and you know from here I can configure my channels, four to twenty milliamp, etc., zero to ten volts, whatever whatever I want. Um, configure those changes. So, you know, just a quick demo of adding something on there. There's communication modules available as well. Um, so I'm actually going to add one of those on here as well. Add a comm module. So just kind of the basics here. So like I mentioned, like all of the, the modules that are available for that CPU will just show up. Uh, within this hardware catalog for you automatically. Um, and it's an easy drag and drop. You can shift them around if you need to. Sometimes, you know, I might have to update some stuff in the background and take a few minutes, but uh, in this case, you know, I have a fresh program, so it's nice and easy. All right, so, you know, after you've built all your all of your racks and, and added all of your modules, um, you know, there's a few other things you can do with your, your variable editor. So I can open this guy up. It's called the data editor down here, uh, it's going to list all your different variable types. You know, this is where you can create variables on these lines here. Um, you can search for variables using wildcards. You do all the, all the normal features. There's some filters over here for different types of variables. Um, and then on top of variables, there's a, what is called a DDT. So if you've got some programming background, um, a DDT is kind of like a structure. It's a, 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 data, a defined data type or derived data type. Um, and it, yeah, if you're from the Allen Bradley world, it's as similar as a, as a UDT. So, you know, I can, I can make a, a test DDT. And then within here, you can add, you know, any number of variables you want with different types to them. Um, and then there's a tab for function blocks. This is actually showing you what function blocks are used within your program. And I don't have any use right now. And then something called DFBs, which are derived function blocks, which is you know similar to the data types 
you can create your own functions as well. So creating an EFP and, you know, comparable to Alan Bradley, which is, you know, uh, they've got an AOI uh, or add-on instruction. So this is similar here. You can, you can create it here pretty easy. You create it. You want to add inputs. You uh, open the inputs folder. You can add an input really easily. Output. And then, uh, you know, you can add sections to that, to that function. Um, so I'll just uh, demonstrate that real quick. I can make a function block diagram section. Um, there's some other features here that allow you to add organization to your sections, uh, adding a functional module. Uh, you can also put a conditional statement on it that turns the entire section on and off if you really wanted to. Um, and then you can change the name. So I'm going to go ahead and, oops. so I hit apply and I'll make it create that for me. So that's, you know, I'm not going to go through and program a whole function, but you know, you can imagine I can add all my variables. I can open it from uh, this side menu as well. Close the hardware catalog. And uh, it, through here, I can, I can go in and add uh, different functions um, and start my programming. Um, the way you generally do that in here is there's a uh, FFB input assistant. And I can type in a, any function. I'm going to put an AND block. So if, hopefully you guys are familiar with function block diagram. It's kind of a standard programming language within, uh, for a lot of PLCs. And uh, you, can, you can throw these down and you know, start programming. Um, there's a, yeah, a number of features associated with these, which I, I can kind of show you guys um, real quick. Uh, there's help on type, you know, any function that you want to you wanna look at. It's going to ex explain exactly how it works. It's really easy to pull this up and know what you're doing. Um, the other way to search for functions, if you don't know the name, because you probably saw me type that in real quick, you can hit these three dots and uh, you can browse what is in your library. So I'll expand that for you guys. Uh, so I'm going to click on the library, and it gives me all the function blocks that are built into Unity. Um, it separates them out by some folders over here. So you know I can look at the base library. There's absolute value. There's at edition, you know, all the way through uh, a number of other things, all the comparisons that you'd ever need, um, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So you can you can search for them there. Um, so that, that covers pretty much all the all the variables and how you just real briefly how you can make them. Um, there's a communication folder here, so you can create networks and attach them to uh, your network cards. On some of the newer PLCs, you you don't necessarily need to configure your networks here. They're they're sometimes automatically configured on your CPU. So especially in the case of a of an M580, um, I can actually click on this EIO network down here and it'll show me the details related to this network and I can configure it here. Um, on some of the older uh, PLCs and, and including M340s, uh, you may have to create a network and then attach that network to a uh, network card. So it's pretty easy to create the network. You might have to pick the type of network card that you're gonna attach it to. So this list will grow depending on the processor you've chosen. And then you can go in and set up your IP address and all that for that particular network. All right, and then uh, you can create programs and tasks. So the, this is called the, uh, the master task. Um, and there's a folder called logic. Um, you create a new section within here. And this is, this is pretty much the, the easiest way to create a section within Unity. Um, it's just a cyclic execution so that it will run from the top all the way down to the bottom as fast as it can um, and it will just keep going so as you add sections to this it'll execute you know top to bottom or top left to right top to bottom and uh, you know kind of basic execution um, there's there's also the ability to add these other types of sections so you can add a subroutine you can add a timer event or an IO event so some of the asynchronous type sections as well which if you come from the Allen Bradley world, you might be a little bit more familiar with that since that's kind of the, the standard there. Um, but, you know, Unity makes it, or Control Expert makes it really easy uh, to just set up cyclic sections here. Um, 
All right, so uh, next would be animation tables. Uh, this would be equivalent of like a watch window. So you can uh, add your variables here. Um, and you can modify these and view them while connected to the PLC um, in order to troubleshoot or, or, or monitor something. Um, there's also something called operator screens, um, which is some basic visualization that you can actually do within Control Expert. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call it a substitute for visualization, visualization software, you know, by any means. It's, it's pretty basic. But if you didn't have any sort of visualization software and you wanted to test your code and, you, you know, it'd be really easy if you had some, something that changed colors or whatever, um, you could draw that up actually on these operator screens um, and animate it while connected to the PLC. So, uh, yeah, that's something that is available in here. Doesn't get used very often because generally most people are going to have some sort of operator interface terminal or SCADA system that connects them. And then you've got some documentation. This is just kind of pre populated information that makes it easy to print um, your whole program once you, you've kind of added everything in here. What you can do is come in here, include the headings, and then uh, you, can, you can just do like a, a basically a file print here, control P, and then print that to a PDF and it'll spit out. Uh, a bunch of details about you know your program, your variables, all, all of the all of the stuff that you configured. Um, kind of gives you a standard layout of that if you if you keep that documentation anywhere. All right, and then one more thing I wanted to show you guys um, is underneath the tools. There's a number of things here. We're not going to cover all of them today, but um, there is something called uh, the DTM browser. So it's right here in the middle. Uh, the DTM browser is sort of a newer-ish feature over the last few years where this is going to allow you to configure um, your distributed I.O. Um, and what that is, is, you know, I, I've added a network card here and I can add a bunch of Ethernet enabled field devices uh, to that network card. And I'm going to do it through the DTM browser. So you can right click on that network card and add something to it. And essentially what this is, is a list of devices. Uh, that have electronic data sheet files, so EDS files, uh, both from Schneider Electric, but also if you scroll down, you'll see a number of other things, uh, another other, other companies here, um, you know, drives, uh, flow meters, anything like that, that they provide an electronic data sheet. You can come in here and add that device very easily to your configuration. Um, so, you know, for example, I can add in, uh, let's see, Multibar 61 drive. Um, and when I add that on here, it'll automatically configure that device. It, it knows what registers that I, I would want to be reading and, and writing to uh, in order to control it. because so that's all built into that data file that you can, you can generally, if, it, if it's not already included in the software in Control Expert, you can actually download those data files online and import them into your program. And then when you open this up, uh, you can configure it. And, and look at the, the type of drive and show the file itself. This is the raw data sheet file there. So, you know, this can get pretty complicated in setting these up, but this, this uh, tool makes it pretty easy just to add those data sheets in here and, and get everything going. You know, you, then you go in and change your, your IP address and, and all that. All right. And then uh, another thing really quick is there's something called a simulator mode. So, there's standard mode if I want to connect to a, a real piece of hardware, a real, a real CPU uh, that I've got on a test bench or maybe even just you know, on site. Uh, you want to make sure your program is in, in standard mode for that. If I'm in simulation mode, which I, I am right now, what that means is I can actually uh, build my program and then download it into a simulator uh, that's running on the PC. So I am going to go ahead and you can set the address and it'll tell you which one you're selected on. So right now I'm, I'm checked for the simulator here um, and it's the loopback address on my computer. So when I hit connect, it'll actually just connect um, right to that simulator that's running on my computer. And right now it says I've got a different program running in there. So on my status bar, but it is running um, and it's not built. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to transfer that over. 
and I'll have to uh, rebuild. I think, uh, oh, you know what? I think I got some errors earlier and I, I didn't notice them down in my watch window. Oh, I uh, had an empty type, I didn't like that. So yeah, this is a status bar down here is important to pay attention to. <laughs> uh, so let's go ahead and transfer that again. So I'm gonna check the box for PLC run after transfer since this is just on the simulator, but you know, generally a good one to pay attention to if you are connected to a live PLC. All right, and now I can run my PLC and I can load up these sections. Um, and so this is my DFP section, but I'm going to, I'm going to look at my, my test section that I created under this master task here. And you can see it's gray, um, which is actually means it's, it's being animated. Um, and I will add this real quick. So let's add a block and then let's add a test variable. And then I can actually build this online. So what I'm going to do is I can do it from here, PLC, or sorry, build build changes. So instead of rebuilding the entire project, I can just build the changes that I made. Um, you'll see I'm still, I'm still connected and equal, but I've modified my program. Um, and there, there's another button here you can press to modify the changes. So I can go ahead and build that. And what that's doing is it's building it online, right? So downloading and executing online changes. And now when this loads in, my program seamlessly incorporated this new code. Um, and I can turn on that variable, animates green. I can turn it off, animates red. So easy way to, to determine, you know, what your code is doing while connected to it. And then, like I mentioned before, I can also use these tables um, and turn it on through the table and then go view it in the animation window. So, um, yeah, for the most part, that's that's the main stuff I wanted to show you guys there. So, like I said, if you used it before, hopefully a lot of that's familiar. Uh, maybe there's one or two things that you learned there. But if you if you hadn't used it before, it kind of give you a real good overview of, of the major features and generally what it looks like to use the software. Hey Zach, I'm going to take a minute to just answer a question that just came up in the chat. I think I actually failed to mention it. If you guys have questions or things as we go, please log log them in the Q and A section or chat section. We'll We'll definitely answer them by the end if we can't as we go. Um, but there was a question. So when you build the program and don't save and close the program, can you still grab the code from the controller? Is that uh, something you can address? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I believe you can. Uh, so we can test that right now. Um, so if I, yeah, if I close this program. And uh, you can open it back up and it, it, you know, it should only take about a, a minute or so to test that. Um, but yeah, generally, yeah, you, you do want to save your program pretty often. Um, so let's see if I, I can connect here. You will have to remember the password. Um, and then I can transfer project from PLC and yeah, it, it apparently it, it did save it within there and, and I can open it up. So Yes, you can do that, um, but let's we can double check to make sure my online changes are still there. Um, so let's see. Open up that section, and yeah, there we go. So yeah, I, I technically didn't need to save it on my PC. It was saved in the inside the simulated PLC in this case. Um, but yeah, generally you are going to want to save that uh, <laughs> somewhere. So test program, I'll save that on my desktop. So just like that. Um, yeah. So yeah, great question. That was a, that's a good call. But yeah, uh, Luke, do you want to pass it over back to the to the slides, and we can talk a little bit about networking? All right. Thank you. All right, so just to talk a little bit more about the networking, um, you know, I glanced over a lot of stuff, but in general, like if you're using the M5E, it supports both remote IO and distributed IO. And then some of the other models, you know, like the Quantum also does remote IO. Um, 
but the M and then the M340 also can support uh, distributed I/O. Um, and what I kind of mean by those is the remote I/O um, is sort of like extension of the rack I/O. So you you can kind of think like hardwired signals being wired into your normal analog and digital modules. Those are in your local rack. You can also have um, network racks that just have you know I/O modules in them, and they share a CPU between them. Uh, and so we call that remote I/O. The the newest version of that is Ethernet I/O. So you know using Ethernet cables, um, latest protocols. Distributed I/O is a little bit different in that it it's very similar but different in that it's it's generally other Ethernet type networks or or other protocol networks um, that you're networking into your CPU that are external of the actual hardwired I/O. And usually, you know, we segregate those for networking purposes. So you can kind of see you've got these, these Ethernet racks here, uh, two drops connected back to the M580 in a redundant loop. So there's two cables going into each one. And then, for example, of the distributed I.O., you can have a drive coming off of this other port here where the Altbar process drive is driven off of a separate network. And that would, I would kind of consider that to be distributed I.O. versus the Ethernet I.O. And with that distributed I.O., you know, there's a, there's a wide range of of protocols that are supported. Um, you do potentially have to switch hardware depending on which one you're going to use. Um, so there's a number of different cards, like networking cards that you put in your rack. Uh, you know, Modbus TCP, it, does, it supports Ethernet IP, IEC 61850, which is a sort of like an electrical device uh, standard. So can open AS interface, Profibus DP. There's also some in-rack switches and in-rack fiber conversions. So if you're tight on space in your panel, but you've got an open slot in your rack, uh, you can throw a switch in there. And it's got, you know, I mean, uh, I think up to four ports. Uh, so, all right. And then, yeah, a quick comparison. So, you know, Studio 5000 is probably the most well-known equivalent product. You know, as, as a disclaimer, like we're not necessarily saying that Control Expert is significantly better in any way. They they both do very similar things, and, and you know if, if you're familiar with the other one and you watch me go through that demo, you probably agree. But we, you know, in, my, in our general opinion, we have noticed some slight differences between the two. Um, we thought it'd be good to bring them up today. Um, you know, number one, Control Expert can much more efficiently process function block diagram. We've noticed this on on very large projects. Uh, you'll actually run into significant scan time delays if you're using a lot of function block within Studio 5000. Um, it's just the way it executes it. Uh, it's the way it thinks is a little different. So it's not quite as efficient, although, you know, ladder diagram is kind of king within Studio 5000 and works great. Um, Studio 5000 actually has a slight advantage with making online modifications. Uh, as you guys saw, I built my modifications online. It's pretty easy, but what Studio 5000 lets you do is actually preview your changes and watch it animate before you push it out into the controller. Um, and just it lets you test it a little bit more, which is always best practice to test your code before you push it out on the production, um, which, you know, nice, nice little advantage there for, for Studio 5000. Um, control Expert does let you modify functions while online, you know, within some limitations. Um, and remember, those are called BFBs in Control Expert. Um, so you, you can tweak the code within them and, and do a number of other things uh, while you're still connected and online where, and I believe in, in Studio 5000, you, you can't touch those whatsoever without having to do a full download and stopping your process and, and putting a new program in there. So control expert routines are a little bit easy to set up and organize. Um, this one's a little, kind of a minor one, but, uh, you know, 90% of applications you can you can throw almost every single one of your program tasks within that master cyclical task, and you just organize them as you need to, and it just runs. Um, it's, it's easy to set up. doesn't take as much thought to, to set up the asynchronous timers and which one needs to run when. The, the, the PACs that Schneider and, and now Bradley develop are, are very, very fast now. So, um, you know, majority of the applications, you're not even going to need to worry about the scan time. Um, uh, Alan Bradley does have stricter firmware management between the software and the PLC, so you can't always go backwards uh, once you upgrade your software. 
You might even be stuck upgrading the firmware of your PLC if you upgrade versions of Studio 5000. So, and especially between you know the older versions of their software, and you're, yeah, you you're actually stuck updating your hardware. And in the in the Schneider world with Control Expert, you can update to the latest version of Control Expert, and you don't need to worry about upgrading your actual PLC firmware and going and messing with the hardware. Um, it'll always be backwards compatible in the libraries. Even the libraries with older versions will um, work in the newer versions of Control Expert. Um, and then the Control Expert PLC simulation is easy to set up and use. Uh, Studio 5000 has an emulator as well, or what they call an emulator. Um, it's a little bit less intuitive and has a little bit more restrictions to it. But uh, I, I, I personally uh, prefer the Control Expert simulation. All right, and then uh, just a few tips and tricks for you guys, just the stuff that I've learned over developing a you know, long period of time. Um, you know, there's a few features I think I, I mentioned during the demo is the find and replace variables. So you can copy and paste your functions and right click it and replace the variables. So if you have a very strict tagging standard, um, it's very easy to duplicate your code and replace it and add a new instrument or a new motor or a new valve. Um, without having to do too much work and retesting, um, especially if you've architected your, your functions in a way that are you know, fairly standard across your entire system or your facility, um, you know, you can save yourself a lot of time. Uh, and yeah, overall, make it a lot better. So next is standardize on, on one version of software. So it's kind of a tip. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, the control expert, you can, it does support the, older versions of the software. So you can actually take an old version or maybe like Unity 4.0 and you can you can import that into Control Expert without a problem. Um, and it does, it, it really builds the program within that. Um, but generally you do want to standardize on one version of the software. Otherwise you will have to rebuild the, the archive file each time um, that you're, you're modifying the program. Um, it's kind of like a, there's a lot of nuances to this one, and we want, I don't, I don't want to get into all of them, but, but generally, you, throughout your organization, you want everybody using the same version. Um, and then when you do upgrade, it's pretty easy to just to upgrade to that new version um, of convention. All right, and then tag editing and creation. Um, so you can export all of your variables as a text file, or you can also do it as the native.xsy file. Um, it's just kind of a Schneider type file. You can edit these in Excel and with the text files, just tab delineated, or you can even open up uh, within a variables management Excel macro that is provided by Schneider. You can get it on the online uh, through the support website. Um, and that lets you edit the XSY file and you can make some modifications there. Um, and so you can duplicate tags and you know, use all the features of Excel to, to create those really easily. And then import them back into your program without having to, you know, Type each one individually. And then the last thing is the XML exports. Um, everything within the project browser that I showed you guys, all the variables, the program sections, the functions, the DDTs, the, you know, the structures, all of that can be exported in an XML format, which is kind of shown on the screenshot here. And it's if you're somewhat familiar with programming, it's pretty easy to digest and this gives you a lot of power to modify your code and functions and things outside of the development environment and you know lends itself to doing some automation type tasks on actually developing your code, which can save you a lot of time. Um, and so, yeah, I think from here, I will pass it over to Alex from Schneider Electric, um, and he's going to be talking about some new features in the next version. All right, thank you. Um, as said in the introduction, I'm Alex Cruz. I'm the automation system and architect expert for the Southern California region. And today we're going to be discussing these three topics. I'll give a brief roadmap of what's to come later this year. We'll dive into some new features introduced with Control Expert version 15. And finally, the introduction of the Monocons Users Group, or MUG for short. So first off, here's what we have on the roadmap for our integration tools and software platforms for the rest of 2021. 
Uh, looking at the green section, we have recently introduced our situational awareness libraries for the water and wastewater segment. And we are continuously working to be able to provide easier integration with segment specific libraries, in addition to your own custom libraries to achieve your process control needs. On the software side in the blue section, we'll be improving our cybersecurity robustness in accordance to IEC standards, as well as introducing software support for redundant IO network architectures. And then here's what, a look at what we have coming on our hardware end. Uh, we're introducing new part numbers in our new Monocon switch lineup that were, were released earlier this year. Um, they are replacing the Connexium switch product line. Uh, we're introducing capabilities for redundant CRA as well as a safety level six M580 that will be introduced towards the end of the year and into 2022. As mentioned in the previous slide, further IEC cybersecurity compliance and certifications will be coming later this year to the M580, improving its robustness and resilience to cybersecurity attacks. Now we'll discuss new features and improvements that came with version 15 of Control Expert. And version 15 is currently the latest version of Control Expert. So first introducing, we have a new communication block that now allows data to be passed between controllers without needing to tie the data to a Modbus address. This becomes beneficial when needing to pass critical data such as motor or pump information as an example. You no longer need to unpack your custom data types for a field device so that another controller can have access to the data. Some limitations do include enabling of data dictionary in the project settings and all the data dictionary is, is a, it's a variable database file that is readable by other Modicon systems um, such as other M580s, other M340s or even our OPC OFS software. And this feature is available for M340s with a firmware version greater than version 3.3 and M580s with firmware version greater than 3.2 CPUs. Uh, there is a limit to the amount of data throughput between each instance of function block, and that is one kilobyte of data. Uh, additionally, each pin can be any data type as long as the receiving data type or the, the, the data type you're reading from matches on the other controller. The second new feature is that we have been improving the search functions for all instances, um, including inside the nested derived function blocks. Um, this will enable you to improve efficiency, productivity, and also reduce the time to market. Uh, next, we introduced uh, a feature called Data Memory Protect. Um, this is, when creating a new project, this is disabled by default, um, but you can enable it in the project settings, and then after that, enable it in the controller settings. And what it, it essentially allows you to do is allows variable protection from unauthorized write access. This enhances cybersecurity by moving the protection from the HMI level down to the controller. This also helps to reduce the amount of data you want to be accessible by other devices on the network. So for example, if you had, um, if you're reading Modbus addresses previously, there was no way to protect that from another device uh, being able to read that information or write to it. Well, with, the, with this, we can now allocate a section of Modbus addresses that you want to be accessible and then have the rest of it blocked off with, um, with no read or write access. And as noted, only controllers with former greater than or equal to those listed may have this feature enabled. Okay. And um, another feature we've improved on is our reporting to syslog server. So in addition to what's shown, some events able to be forwarded to the server are such our TCP connection denied due to access control, uh, enabling disabling communication services outside of the configuration, um, ethernet port statuses such as link up and down events, RSTP topology change and change of state in the PLC is just to name a few. And then finally, we have uh, multi-instance PLC simulators. So this now gives the ability to simulate explicit communications between controllers. And what I mean by explicit communications is um, function blocks in your logic that will initiate the communications. So as uh, Zach was showing earlier with our DTMs and any, any communication that's set up in that table is referred to as an implicit communication. And those are, we cannot uh, simulate those with our multi-simulator setup. Um, in order to instantiate uh, multiple simulators, you can modify the port set or the port um, the port that's going to be used in your simulator IP address. So you see earlier we have our loopback address 127001 and we have a colon dot or a colon 503. 
we will now inst um, instantiate a new simulator. So we can have, you see in the, in the image there, we have multiple simulators running at the same time. And so now I just want to go in and talk a little bit about what the Modicon users group is. Um, essentially, this is a group that connects the people that use our hardware and software with our latest automation solutions. Uh, we meet about every other month on average for an hour and a half. Um, it's an hour and a half webinar to discuss the, the technology. Um, while the meeting is geared towards or, or more on the technical side, um, we're meeting by the people who are um, working with our systems all the time, people who are implementing it, it is not overly technical. So you don't need to be an expert or control expert. You don't need to be an expert on the M580s or anything like that to be able to attend these sessions and get a, a good understanding on them. Uh, some of the past topics that we've discussed is um, DMP3 communications um, with our uh, new NO, NOP module and also OPC UA communications with our NUA OPC module. Uh, if you'd like to see what's coming in the near future, I strongly encourage you to join and attend our sessions. Great, thanks, Alex. Appreciate you. Oh, uh, one last thing, sorry. Uh, and then, um, so essentially, how to find it is the Modicon Users Group. You can type it into Google. Um, I'll also post a link in the chat if you are if you're interested, and you can click on that and sign up for it. Um, and also, when you have that Google search, you will get a link to our forum, which is um, hosted on our Shine Electric Exchange. Um, you can go ahead and sign up and take a look to see what the uh, community is discussing. Um, so with that, thanks, and um, I'll hand it back to Luke. Yeah, sounds good. It's always the answer. Where, if you need to find something, uh, head to Google. So um, yeah, I would definitely encourage you guys, uh, to encourage everyone, uh, you know, along with EA to, to participate in that Modicon user group, especially if you're a current user or you're considering it. So we got a bunch of questions that have come across, which is great. Um, I'll throw a couple of these out and we'll get them answered. And if there are any others, again, feel free to throw them into the Q&A section. Um, so there's a question, I think uh, Zach or Alex, either one of you, but which setting would you turn on to allow offline modification um, that while still connecting or verifying that you're connected to equal? Um, so yeah, if you're making offline modifications to the program, You'll, you won't be able to connect as equal as soon as you build the program. So you, if you, if you're intending to make, if you're intending to connect as equal, so that you can you can make modifications to it and view the animations, you cannot make modifications before you do that. Um, so that's kind of, yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of a limitation of pretty much any PLC. But um, if you do make those offline modifications and you build them and then connect, it, it'll show up as different. And what you'll have to do is retransfer the whole program to that PLC, and that will stop the process. Uh, anything connected to it, right? Whatever your fail states are, it will turn off everything um, for the period that it's downloading, and then it'll it'll restart uh, and potentially re uh, reset your memory as well. Um, so I hope that answers your question on that one. Um, I think technically there's kind of a little bit of a a weird piece where you can you can make online uh, or you can make offline modifications if you don't build them yet and you connect and as long as your original program was the same program that was in there it'll show equal and then you can build the changes online after that um, but that's kind of the same as just connecting making the changes and then building them online in the first place so uh, all right and then yeah so hopefully that that answers your question yeah uh, Cool. I think we covered this next one a little bit earlier, but maybe there's a little bit more to it. So can the software transfer um, any of the legacy PLCs, something like a PLC that was that used concept or ProWorks NXT? Yeah, yeah. So you could you can take a concept or a ProWorks program um, and there's a conversion process that you go through that imports it in. Uh, it's mostly automated, but there's definitely some legacy stuff that that isn't always supported. Um, there's some good documentation that you can find online that uh, kind of identifies that stuff. I mean, some of it is just trial and error. If you've done it a lot, you kind of know what to look for. Um, but yeah, there, you can you can definitely save a lot of that code um, and bring it into the latest version of Control Expert. It'll still be in the old language of Lateral Object 984 if you're in ProWorks. Um, but yeah, it is it is possible. Okay. Um, another one here. Uh, can you set R two RS two thirty two 
port protocol um, RTS slash TCS delay to 10 milliseconds for M340 or momentum unity. It's a pretty technical one. Yeah, that's a that's a tough one to answer off the top of my head. You know, I'd, I'd have to go look at the at the the settings for that. Um, I believe that delay is adjustable, um, but yeah, I would I'd have to dig into the into the programming itself and, and possibly look through the help to to see what the range of that particular delay is. Any additional insight from you, Alex, or kind of one of those we? Got um, I know with the um, I'd have to check on the on the processor uh, RSC32 port and the momentum one, but I know for the BMX NOM 0200 module, which is our serial communications module, yeah, that, that setting is is adjustable. Okay. Awesome. Um, and then what, uh, this might be kind of an, an obvious one or maybe a le less obvious, but uh, which, which version do you recommend? Do you both recommend or at this point? I mean, is it, is it one of those things where you want to stay pretty current as best you can? Uh, when did version 15 come out, Alex? When was it officially released? Officially released uh, at the end of last year. So December last year. Okay, so it's still relatively it relatively new, but like you showed it in the roadmap. Um, yeah, what would you guys suggest? Or is that something where you want people to be early adopters and take that on? Or do you see people stay a version behind? How, how do you how do you generally recommend people follow along? What 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 I usually recommend is um, if you have, you know, this is a new installation, you know, you don't, this is your first dip into the M580, M340 world, always go with the latest version or the latest version that's available. Um, it has all the latest cybersecurity, all the, you know, new features that you can take a look at. Um, if you have an install base and then, you know, you're already using an older version of Unity, you may want to stay at that version just so there's a consistency and uniformity across all your controllers. But definitely, I always recommend to go with the latest one. Yeah, it kind of loops back on what Zach was talking about, maybe making sure you're standardized on the version you are using, which can become difficult if you're, if everybody's always grabbing the latest one, you know, and, uh, and putting it on their machine. Okay, great. Um, this one sounds like a pretty client specific question, uh, but are there benefits or what might the benefits be of using an M340 as a master to a Murphy, um, a Murphy pump control panel? So I think you see the question there, Zach, in the, in the Q&A. Yeah, you know, I, I personally am not familiar with the, with the Murphy uh, pump control panel itself. Um, so I, I'd probably have to ask you a few questions to, to dig into that to, to understand exactly how that's working um, and to give you more insight on that. So I, I don't think I have a, a good answer for you on that yeah. one. Yeah, it's a tough one. That's definitely a, a pretty specific one. I think that what comes to mind from, uh, from my understanding in those applications is a little bit more control over the, over the standard you use in those master applications. So, you know, obviously having that M340 and programmed within a Unity or, or EcoStructure control expert environment gives you a lot more resources to maintain the functionality of that versus having to go to a manufacturer like Murphy to make those changes, request those changes, test those changes, deploy those changes. So um, I think it just gives you a little bit more control. Certainly there could be many others, but that's one that jumps out, to, uh, jumps to mind for me. So yeah, um, great questions. We're, we're great to see the interaction. And again, our intent is always as a system integrator to provide useful content and useful information and be a resource for all those end users out there along with Schneider you know, being an Alliance master partner. We work very closely with them to stay on the front edge of all the different version upgrades and all the different software and improvements that they're making and making sure those improvements make it to customers and that they get to utilize uh, the features that make, make the most value sense for them. So, uh, that's, that looks like it for today. We'll let you go a little bit early. We, we do want to say thank you for participating. And uh, if you have any questions, please reach out to us, the contact form on our web, website or the, the email that you got this invitation from are both uh, live and will get back to us. And we look forward to seeing you on the next one. Thanks, everybody.